Thanks for tuning in to the Old Dirty Basement. On this week's episode, we're covering Bob Probert. I mean, look, this is all there is to know about, you know, slap shot, slap in the face, punch to the face, pile drive to the face, skate to the face. It's a lot of faces. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bob had a, uh, it's a pretty good story. Interesting. This guy, you know, started young in hockey, uh, grew up, was uh, an enforcer and, uh, you know, life happens. Yeah. This was a, uh, a hockey story. So we had to call in the juice man to get a little input on this. So got a nice little phone call with him. And uh, this is some story. So anyway, we hope you enjoy it. If you're listening on uh, Spotify or Apple, wherever you're at, leave us that five-star rating and sit back, relax, and enjoy Bob Probert. This is the old dirty basement, home to debauchery, madness, murder, and mayhem. A terror-filled train ride deep into the depths of the devil's den with a little bit of humor history and copious consciousness i'm your announcer shallow throat your hosts are dave matt and zap i love you matthew mcconaughey all right all right all right hey this is dave matt and zap and welcome to the old dirty basement where every week we cover a true crime, murder, or compelling story. So sit back, relax, and comprehend. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the old dirty basement. I am Matt. With me, as always, is Dave and Zap. How's it going, fellas? Great, man. How's it going? Going good, man. Going good. What a, what a great evening. I, I, feel, I feel good this evening. How's everybody feeling? I, too, feel well. Nice. Yeah. I definitely think I'm doing pretty well after uh, going through this story. I think I'm doing all right, but yeah, life is life is weird. And yeah, I just uh, Zap was saying to me earlier, uh, back you know before the mics were on. That's what we say in the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was asking like, how did this guy come across my radar here? Uh, so understand. So if I if I'm to consider that this podcast, at least part of this podcast, is to include, I don't know, serial killer, true crime, or compelling story. I think it was compelling. Mm. It's like a life's yeah. journey. I, I don't. I don't know. I, and that, dude, that's fair. Like, look, different people, different stroke for different folks, right? Yeah, like, yeah. so different people are compelled by different things. I, I can dig that. I, I just had to ask the question because, I, th- this guy for sure, may have committed a crime or two. Mm-hmm. He may have served, you know, some time. But not any more than anyone else for some other petty crimes. But I think it's more of a, a game of life. Like he played a game. You know, he played hockey, mm-hmm. but, but the guy, like his life was there, but, but things happen, things happen in your journey, sometimes for the good, sometimes bad. I'm not really a hockey fan, so I wasn't aware of this guy, but the people that I know that are hockey fans, when I brought up his name, they knew right away who it was. So this guy, I guess in that world is well known and the, the story is well known. I mean, well known enough that they have a documentary on Amazon prime called tough guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got to watch, watch that. Uh, today actually just to kind of get a freshen up on some stuff but uh yeah we actually have a in-house hockey expert yes very the, big hockey expert. The, the juice man who uh who knows hockey and, and it actually runs a uh a charity a charity yes mm-hmm. for um for hockey events and stuff like that and pucks and, and pros pucks with pros, pucks with pros. yeah so we're gonna give him a call then to get a little input on him he he knows people or is associated with people involved in this guy's uh story basically that had either played with him or had known him and stuff in, in the circles he runs in. Obviously, like I said, this guy is well known. So, Dave, what you say is that mirrors everything that I encountered while I was doing my little research in this. I'm I'm the guy that's walking around. Now, I actually like hockey. Like I enjoy hockey, mm-hmm. but I didn't know shit about fuck about this guy when this guy was around. Right. So I'm asking friends of mine and whomever. Hey, man, you know this guy and you know whatever. Oh my God! Yeah, man. yeah. As when I was a kid, oh, we we loved, we loved when you know my insert favorite team name would play the Red Wings or when they would play the Blackhawks. Like this guy was a maniac. He was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. I mean, that's kind of what I got out of it. Yeah, the the gentleman that we are speaking of is uh, Robert Allen Probert. He was born June fifth, nineteen sixty five, in Windsor, Canada. Which Windsor is a cool little town, actually. Um, is that right across from Detroit? Right across from Detroit. I okay. went there one time with our friend Lou. 
Mm-hmm. God rest his soul. Great guy. Oh yeah, oh, Lou. That yeah, Lou. Yeah. Lou. Yeah. We, wow, that's a way back Lou. Yeah, Come he on, had man. a friend. I miss him, man. I miss him. Yeah, He's Lou a cool was dude, the best, man. man. He had a friend that was going to school with him, and he was like, "Dude, I'm going to Detroit. Want to go?" And I was like, "Yeah." So when we got there, his friends like, "Hey, if we go right in the right in the Canada, right across the border." And that's back when you didn't have to have all the shit you have to have today. I mean, you just cross the border. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, fax we cards and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. <gasps> but the, it, I'm thanks just, the government, right? But it was so cool. Like, um, I think cigarettes over there were like a dollar. Dang, they you could buy like I'm a, going to Canada. What were they here at that time? Like, what kind Probably of two fifty. It was like half the price, yeah, if not more. Jeez. Um, we had American money, which anywhere you went, they were like. They treated you as kings. Like there were his friends. Like, oh, there's a strip club we got to go to. You had twenty dollars. Like just girls flocking. Nowadays, like, wow, that's twenty merc. And nowadays they'll just you know yeah. prefer pesos. Yes. But it is. It's it's, it's a cool little. It's the cool American little dollar isn't worth shit. It's going down. Yeah. However, I would like to go to Canada. I've never been there. It's cool. Yeah. Nor have I. No. You guys should. I go. guess we'll go there today a little bit. Like in the story. Yeah, in the maybe. story a little bit. A little bit. Well, yeah. Well, um, Robert Probert was raised in Windsor. Uh, he had a loving mother, and his father was actually, like, a pretty tough guy. His dad was a cop. He was in the Army, and he had a brother, Norm. Uh, Bob did. Mm-hmm. And his brother and him, like, his dad taught him hockey at an early age, so that's all they knew. And uh, his dad was 6'3", 225 pounds, and he raised his kids to be strong. Like, he didn't let them cry and stuff like that. Bob said that when he was younger, him and his brother, like, if they were hurt about something, they couldn't do it in front of their dad, so they would go in their room and, like, cry at night. Yeah, I think they called his dad Big Al. Big hey, guy. I know a Big Al. Yeah, Big, yeah. Al. Yeah. Big Al. Yeah, that's what they called him. He was a big guy just like this guy was. So, Look, okay. not for nothing. Six foot three. How many pound? 225. 225. That's a formidable dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, oh, let's not forget, this guy was a cop. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knew how to, you know, say the right things to put mm-hmm. you in the right frame of mind to put you in your place. Right. It's a formidable dude. For and sure. And that's a hell of a father figure. Yeah, yeah somebody... Uh, yeah, it's hard to compare yourself to somebody like that, and I guess you would fight your whole life to even compare yourself. You know, yeah, right. I'm I'm five foot ten, buck seventy five. If I'm lucky, mm. I'm just you know fighting for the scraps. Yeah, and you look at kids nowadays. I mean, they're they're I mean, they just seem like they're that big in high school now. Six three, two mm-hmm. thirty, two forty. Mm-hmm. We just went to the state championship game the other you know about a month ago. I guess it's been now. These yeah. kids are ridiculous. The, the line's three hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. they're all drinking hormone induced milk. There, there's something going on. But uh, still, like he said, still a big guy. Yeah, but Bob, you know, so a regular kind of family, I guess, Canadian family, tough dad, uh, loving mother. Um, But it was said uh, his dad sometimes would bring a gift home and it would be one gift. And he'd say to the boys, here it is. And they'd have to fight for it. Dang. (laughs) I read this in in an article I was looking up. Yeah. And, And it says like, you know. That's how he was with his kids. And, like, sometimes they would get excited, like, Dad's home. And then he'd come there and he'd have this little gift. And he'd sit something on the table and be it like a hockey puck or, mm-hmm. you know, like a new set of gloves or something like that. And the kids are like, oh, thank – like, where's mine? And he's like, nah. Because like, him and his brother, Norm and Bob, were only a year apart. <laughs> Jesus Like the Christ. Hunger Games. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly like the Hunger Games. Yeah, basically. Oh, did you hear about – real quick, this is off the subject real quick, but I heard on the radio today. It might have been on a beginning of a podcast, some other one. They were talking about an experiment they did in England recently where they had 10 boys ages 9 to 12, 10 girls ages 9 to 12, and they gave them the house to themselves for a week. (laughs) What's this? So I said, well, they said the girls, they got together, they banded together, gave gave each other, like, you know, jobs to do. Like, one was in charge of cleaning, this and that and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if they got tired of, like, a girl was having problems doing something, they would all pitch in and help. But they made dinners and stuff like that. So these girls are by themselves in a mm-hmm. house, and the boys are in a separate house by yes, themselves? Yes, in a separate house by themselves. Oh, I gotcha. So they wanted to see how boys and girls at that age from 9 to 12, mm-hmm. like, early, what's that? That's not early childhood. That's uh, that's considered. Is that adolescence? Adolescence. That's yeah. for damn sure adolescence. Yeah. That's your formidable years. We both looked at Zap for that one. <laughs> well, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. No, Thank you very much. No, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, yeah. you know, you're not a baby and you're not a teenager. You know, right. you're right in the middle there. That's adolescence. Right. So these boys, the 10 boys, they, you know, started wrecking the house right away. They were painting on the walls. Like, mm-hmm. they were throwing food, like, all over the place. Never cooked a meal. Mm-hmm. Like, kids were just, like, surviving for themselves, like, grabbing whatever they could eat. 
And uh, then they started developing, like, they started picking on, like, the weaker kid, like, making him do stuff and, like, beating him up if he's not listening and stuff like that. It's oh, like wow. Lord of the Flies shit. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. what he said, exactly like Lord of the Flies. Well, so it wasn't well, very well, much off. Well, and, girl, girls mature a lot quicker, I think they say. Yeah, so that's probably yeah. why they're, they're, I mean, that's what they say. But, yeah, the boys, like, destroyed oh. the house. Like, it, it was it was in shambles. But there's it was, a, there's it was a, interesting. A, a matronly way about girls. You know, it's just born into them. Right. That's why they are the mothers. Right. That's why they are the ones who carry children and, you know, the create the children and they mm-hmm. come out of their bellies and they are the moms. It just comes naturally, yeah. Responsibility comes mm-hmm. natural to these chicks. So uh, this guy, Al Probert, Bob's dad, he had a stroke and he couldn't really walk or talk. So the kids were probably 14, 15 at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a funeral for their dad and they said that neither boy cried or anything like that. They just kind of took it. And within, uh, they said the day after the funeral, Bob was selected for this uh, OHL or this um, hockey league. So oh, he, OHL? No, I think, yeah, OHL. Okay. It was a hockey league for junior hockey players, mm-hmm. and uh, it was in Brantford. So he left the very next day. You know, speaking of hockey, we should probably get our guy on the air here, yeah. uh, the juice man. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sure he'll have some input. Maybe he'll hang out with us a little bit while we go through the story because – he knows hockey inside and out. For sure. So he'll probably be able to, all these different leagues and all that, maybe I'll have some input. So Yeah, we'll have some questions for him. Yo. Juice, man. What's hey. going on? How are you? Good, man. We're on the air talking about uh, our boy here, Bob Probert. So, Good evening, Juice. Juice, is Zap, hey, Zap, Zap's here, Matt's here, myself. Zap, I don't think you and Juice ever f- formally met. but Juice, man, nice to meet you by virtue of this telephone call. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> good, good. So we're at the point now in uh, Probert's life here where his dad, uh, you said, passed away. His dad away. passed away, had a stroke, and he's off to uh, junior hockey. So, like, what league would that be? Like, oh, he said about OHL maybe? Does that sound yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, okay. OHL. He played, uh, did he play in Windsor? Mm-hmm. I think yeah. the, an Adir- what, it started with an A, not Adirondacks. I'm not quite. Windsor Spitfires? No, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound familiar. I'm curious, uh, just for, you know, purposes of, uh, you know, Disclosure. What does OHL stand for? Ontario Hockey League. Okay, just wanted They're, to make sure. Uh, they have a junior league. Um, it's all across Canada. So there's the WHL, which would be the Western Hockey League. Mm-hmm. OHL is uh, Ontario. And then the, they have a Q, uh, QMJHL, which is a Quebec Major Junior League. So what do these leagues serve as? Are these essentially like feeders that, that you know, yeah. you're... Okay. Okay. Have a lot of these kids that they compete with the U.S. colleges. So mm-hmm. oh, okay. kids either have the option of going to college. If they go to college, you're ineligible for a junior, and uh, it's a feeder program for the for the pros. Yeah, I read they about learn and develop. Yeah, I read about they had like an 80 game schedule. A lot of these kids didn't go to school at all because all they did was mostly just just play hockey, mm-hmm. and they were like, granted, these kids were 15, 16. 17 years old, I think was the oldest, mm-hmm. but, yeah. um, yeah. Does that mean you drop, that, that, I don't want to say drop out where, of school. Does that mean you, you don't go to school? Yeah. Like, a lot of these guys didn't graduate no. high school. Oh, go they, ahead. Uh, they're expected to go to school in the cities in the areas where they, they, uh, they go, they play hockey. Was, uh, juice and I actually work with a guy that he, uh, his son's like in one of these right now. Correct. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Who, who his son's yep. like 17, Stellar athlete. Uh, he he could have, you know, baseball, hockey, whatever. He's doing hockey right now. I think he's in Omaha, right? Uh, yes. P- playing for a team. And uh, he a- also got a scholarship, I believe, for college. But this kid's living with a family, going to school, and playing hockey. Like, mm. uh, you know, basically almost full time. They treat it like professional. And uh, Yeah. That was like that movie with Rob Lowe, Youngblood. Youngblood, yeah. yeah. they do that. They, like, yeah. stay in these houses. Dude, he banged the landlord, or the landlady. Yeah, that yeah. happens. <laughs> that happens. Well, and that happened with uh, Bob Probert. Bob yes, Robert it did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where I, I think a lot of these kids, and I, I personally, you know, with knowledge of, of hockey, and it might be in other sports, too, but I think that's where a lot of these kids go off the rails because they leave their, they leave their homes at young ages you know, 15, 16, and right away they're put on a pedestal. They, uh, you know, I, I think it's that's where some of their moral compasses kind of go haywire because, you know, they're living with these families that they don't know. 
Right. Uh, some maybe are, are, you know, keep tabs and, and are good for the kids. But then there's other ones that just basically let them do whatever they want. Hmm. And there's a, a big culture of drinking, hazing. You know, you put a bunch of 15 and 16 and 17 year old kids together and, you know, with very little supervision and, and discipline and they're, they're going to, they're going to do what they want to do. Yeah. They're basically put into a business at the age of 15. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there they are. They're in a business and that those hockey and, teams. And they're put on pedestals. Mm-hmm. Like, right. you know, if, if you listen to, to Bob, Bob Probert, I mean, he was, you know, 17, 18 and, and, you know, heavily drinking, you know, yep. and you got to imagine there's, uh, I remember the story of Wayne Gretzky, you know, he left home at a, at an early age too. And he said he, he cried just about every night for a year. You know, at age 15, so there's depression. So these kids are not only, you know, in this atmosphere where all they have all these peers, but, you know, depression and alcohol. And, and that was a ma- uh, major you know, part of Probert's life, like it, during yeah. his time and, and throughout his life, he always struggled with, with those vices. Right. Yeah. It's so you funny make- you mentioned Wayne Gretzky, Juice Man. It's so funny you just mentioned <laughs> it. Just because of, uh, I mean, I'm thinking in my mind, that championship game when the Edmonton Oilers beat the old Red Wings. Yeah. And Probert was on the Red Wings. Yes. Right. He was amazing in, in the fact that he was such a tough guy, but also could score and put up points. Yeah, the one year he made the uh, All-Star game, I think they said what, he yeah. had 29, 29 goals, and he won like every fight. Yeah. And yeah. they said guys like Wayne Gretzky and uh, a couple of the, the other hockey players just wanted to meet Proby because they yeah. knew that this guy would like kick your ass. So Juice yeah. Man, Juice Man, you have any like Probert stories that maybe weren't on the documentary, or that maybe you heard throughout the years, or anything about the guy? Maybe that um, just people that maybe knew him or played against him. You have any stories like that? Uh, I know a lot of guys that played against him and played with him. In fact, you know when I watched the documentary, you know the one guy Stu Grimson, I know pretty well. He he comes to Hershey, uh, you know, regularly for my event. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, I don't know any personal. Bob Probert stories, but I know a lot about the era that he he played in and and how how he got to where he was. And you you got to imagine that a lot of these, especially the fighters, they they got banged up a lot. And nope. in that era in the eighties, there was you know pain pain pills and pain medication, and that was you know they were basically bowls of them in every every trainer's room. And you know the one guy I know mentions that. You know, he was popping them like Skittles. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's a, and they get, they get addicted to him. But that's funny how you said about fighting. They said that um, Probert, oh, I guess he was saying that he really didn't like to fight. But then when he was in junior hockey, he realized he was bigger than other kids and yeah. that he wasn't as fast. Uh, he wasn't as quick. He wasn't as good of a skater as a lot of guys. And I think he was thinking in order for me to make it to the next level, it, he, he would have to fight his way up. Yeah, I would say 90% of the fighters, you know, those guys that people look at and know, same thing. They, they didn't they didn't want to fight. <laughs> they didn't want to do that. In fact, the one guy, one guy I was talking to said, you know, his mom, when he finally made it to the NHL, it, you know, it took him a couple of years, but he, he did what he had to do. He, he realized early that the only way to stay in the NHL, which would be the difference between, you know, taking planes and buses, uh, and an extra zero on your paycheck was to make the other team hate you and, and fight. He said his mom used to call him every night in tears. And why are you doing this? Why? Well, because she'd watch the game. She'd see his antics. Mm-hmm. Right. And she'd be like, you're a good hockey player. I don't understand why you need to be doing this, you know, getting beat up all the time. And he's like, it, it broke my heart, but it's, it's what I had to do. What, what I really enjoyed about the documentary also was uh, they showed a lot of stuff from the hockey night or what was it called? Hockey Night in America? Hockey Night in Canada. Hey, Hockey Canada. Night in Canada. Yeah, America. Yeah, well, <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> north, sure, north, well, south. Well, they, they might be tuning in too. Yes, right. yes. But uh, yeah, so the, we talked about that during the Spinner Spencer. That's right. Uh, yes, story. yes. But um, these and guys. How, oh, go ahead. How popular that was in Canada. That's huge. And uh, you, if you saw in the documentary, Don Cherry was pretty prevalent. He was the. He coached the Bruins. He won a Stanley Cup with them. But then he went on to be a analyst with Hockey Night in Canada. And they'd have him on in between uh, during the intermissions called Coach's Corner. And that would actually get higher ratings than the actual game. Yeah, that was fun to watch because they they loved they loved uh, Probert. They, they 
Like yeah, this guy incredible. walked on water there. He's like, this guy's like, you don't yeah. get you don't get Probert mad. And then this guy, like, he he would punch goalies. He would. He didn't care. Yeah, yeah. he didn't care. This was the sideshow. Understand, I am not putting this guy down in any way. This guy was an incredible hockey player, incredible inspiration to to hockey players all over the place. Like this is how you play the fucking game, right? But I mean, looking back on it, having seen the movie since, this is this guy's almost like the Happy Gilmore of of hockey, only because he was so much of that attention drawer. You mean right. just a fighter? Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm saying it's not. I'm not saying that this guy was a clown or anything like that. This. This is just simply a goon, oh, a draw. No, he was a draw. Come on, no. While while hockey is going on, this is the guy we want to see, right? Yeah, they yeah, called him Probo Cop. Probo Cop, yeah. And that's part of the hockey culture, especially up in you know. Look at the movies like Slapshot and mm-hmm. Young Blood, and you know, fighting was important, and it was uh, it was almost idolized. And you, you heard Don Cherry in the one documentary say that you know during a fight nobody gets up and goes to the back to get another beer. Yeah, or get yeah nobody nobody goes for coffee during the, during the Probert fight. Right? No. Yeah. He said everybody right. was stuck to their seats. I've been to games my whole life. I've been going to games since I was you know I can remember. And in Buffalo, you know when there you know crowd would be quiet, crowd would be sitting, the the you know flow would be going back and forth, and all of a sudden there'd be a, a fight and the place would come alive. And that was in just about every arena, uh, especially back in that era. It, it, it just, it woke everybody up. People, it, people loved it. It's exciting to see. I mean, being a, you know, I won't even say casual fan. I watch hockey, you know, I don't really watch hockey when it's on. If somebody has it on, I'll watch it. But the fighting, uh, I mean, that's exciting to watch. It's kind of, you know, yeah. do they even still do that as much? They anymore? don't fight like that anymore. No, they just kind of break no. it up. It's no, not. that, uh, I think what happened, like in the in the early early days, everybody was tough. Mm-hmm. Hockey was a tough sport. You'd have, you know, bench clearing brawls. You have everybody in ice fighting, and then you got into this era where you had guys like Gretzky that were just so skilled, mm-hmm. but they weren't fighters. More finesse. So you, the yeah. team started to have to have guys on their team to kind of protect them, mm-hmm. and these guys just like Probert became, you know, celebrities. And, and fan favorites. And then every team had to have one. And then every team had to have one that was, you know, bigger and better than the next one. Mm-hmm. And it became a, almost like a sideshow to the, to the game. And eventually it got to be almost, uh, you know, circus like where these staged fights and these guys didn't contribute much to the team. They just go out there and fight. And I think the league didn't like that. And finally, uh, they found a way to kind of phase that out and to, into what we have today, you know, more of a finesse game and back and forth. And, you know, those guys that were like that, you know, with those skills, they, they couldn't keep up in today's game. So they've mostly all been phased out. Juice, man, it is amazing to hear you say the, the really just describe the evolution of hockey. I mean, you, uh, no, and it's true. So, yeah. you know, there was at one point, I don't know if the channel still exists, but there was at one point ESPN Classic. Mm-hmm. So yeah. on, on ESPN Classic, on the randomest times, you would, I should say one would, be able to watch a very old hockey game. Right. And these are dudes without helmets, oh, without yeah. anything. Like, they're lucky if they're wearing pads at all, mm-hmm. just skating around. And it's just after the dawning of black and white becoming color right on you know in filming so it, everything moved so slowly right these guys are just passing the puck it's like you know in training right you're just you know the the i just think of the mighty ducks where they're shifting the egg mm-hmm. a, across the ice and stuff like that then it goes to come on man you know we got to we got to do something more with this game so you know aggression starts to kick in or something you know i want to score more goals what can we do to make this game more exciting then we get into that fighting era, and then it becomes into that finesse era that we were just talking you about. You said with Gretzky and them guys. Yeah, with yeah. Gretzky and all of them. And now, I mean, you go to a hockey game now, these guys are bullets. These guys, like, yeah. they don't have time to fight. They're skating at, like, 100 miles an hour. Plus, a oh, fight yeah. can cost your, your career. It's, it's un- not worth it. It is unbelievable how fast that game goes anymore. It's, it's unreal. Mm-hmm. It is fast. Yeah. So now we, they have trackers with technology of trackers in, in guys' uniforms. And, you know, they they regularly show guys skating you know, almost 40 miles an hour up and wow. down the ice. That's unbelievable. And, well, they uh, do that in the All-Star games. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
That's, yeah. That is wild. You know, we were talking earlier about Slapshot, and as people know that listen to the show, we do Vintage Cinema Review. One of my favorites, by the way. Yeah. And the Juice Man's got connections, right, Juice, on the Slapshot? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. at some point we hope to get hooked up with Juice Man and his connections and maybe have some people from Slapshot come on for a Vintage Cinema Review. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, that's one of, I think if you ask just about every professional hockey player, that's, that ranks as one of their favorite favorite top, movies. Top yeah. hockey movie, you would say? Slapshot? Amongst? Yep. Okay. What would be like number two, if you had to guess? Like, what is Youngblood? Right. Is that looked at? Is that frowned upon? Or is that, because that's one that I like back in the day. Well, Rob I Blood think cool. since, that, it would have been, but since Miracle came along, and Miracle was oh, so Mir- well yes. done. Yeah, got to be Miracle. Uh, yeah. That is a great that's movie, That's a too. phenomenal story, phenomenal movie. They, they did such a good job with that. You know, that's with Kurt Russell, actual, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's inspirational. Mm-hmm. Inspirational. Yeah. Well, Juice Man, as always, man, you're our guy for anything hockey-related, anything like that, so we always appreciate reaching out to you and, yeah. and having you on. Yeah, man. this story, I, I looked at it a little bit, you know, but when you asked me to come on, and it's just, uh, it is heartbreaking, you know, when you hear about the drugs and the, oh, mm-hmm. definitely. the lifestyle uh, that uh, these guys get, get sucked into, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, peer pressure, and then, uh, you know, I, I know there's a, a pro player that I know pretty well that is very very out in the open about his, his struggles. And he got addicted to, to pills and he describes it as just, you know, withdrawal from once he realized he was, you know, he just had to come off. It was like four months of like the worst With withdrawal, flu, the worst, oh. you know, and then uh, they, of course they give you drugs to come off the drugs and that changes you. And, and that was just, with he, with Probert. He was he was back and forth, back and forth, and it's like he wanted to get off, but then he it, it just kept overtaking him and well, bringing him right back. Well, the in. amazing thing that I, that I never thought of until I saw a documentary is these guys were were you know a lot of them were taking cocaine, were on cocaine, and you know, and then out there playing hockey under the influence of cocaine, and Jeez. you know, some of the guys are like, imagine fighting a guy that you know is. It's, under yeah. the influence of a, a drug like that, you know, you're punching the guy in the face. He's not even blinking. And they used know? to say Probert had that in his eyes sometimes too, where they could tell like, Oh yeah. shit, like we, we really shouldn't be here today. And he would, he would, those times he would scare teams, like the whole team pretty much. I knew yeah. It was, yeah. That's, that's just yeah. crazy, but he's all jacked up on that powder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I know with, uh, I know that we're at the point where we're, uh, we're, we're looking to call this, uh, you know, short here, but juice man, I, I got to wonder. So when you hear the names of, I don't know, like the Broad Street Bullies, as brought to us by one of our biggest fans, mm-hmm. born, and, born and raised in Philadelphia, or, yeah. I don't know, Willie Plett you know, of the Minnesota North Stars, uh, yeah. what makes Probert stick out? Like, why, why I, I, I want to say it, to, you know, just so succinctly, but why does he get the movie? Why does he get the attention? You know, what... what what or just in your mind, what makes Probert stick out over again any other you know big brawler way back when? He was bigger, stronger, tougher than than all of them, and he he took a lot of them down. Uh, well, I guess not not a lot of like the Broad Street bullies, but if you look at the size, you know, look at the height and, and weight of those guys compared to to Probert. You know, Probert was the, the new era of guys that were, you know, I think Probert was 6'3", probably, you know, 240 to, you know, around there. Mm-hmm. Just just a massive guy. And uh, he had the edge on a lot of guys, and that's that's why a lot of other teams started, you know, looking in the looking in the farms of, of you know, mm-hmm. uh, remote Canada for, for the, the bigger guys. That's awesome. One guy get his name, but he, he came in, he was like six, six. Jeez. Um, <laughs> on on skates, yeah, like six, yeah, and, ten. Yeah. Yeah. And the guys, uh, they're talking to Scott Parker and, and he was talking about, you know, punching guys and knowing that he was hurting them and just mm. how it made him feel and how it almost, you know, kind of messed these guys up that they were, you know, inflicting this pain because at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're humans and oh, they're out almost there doing like a, a job. Almost like a PTSD you know. thing. Yeah. 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 I can, I can, I can believe that. Yeah. yeah Probert and uh, who was uh, Joey Coker? Was that the Joey other guy? Coser, Coser, yeah. Coser, yeah. Coser. Yeah. The, the Bruise Brothers. The Bruise Brothers. That's what yeah. they, they were lovingly yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Juice Man. Well, I appreciate the uh, the input. 
and you know we're always in touch. Juice Man's always contributing, yeah. man. Yeah. He's letting he's let, always giving me cool facts and stuff. So we'll definitely be reaching out in in the future. And uh, no problem. We'll catch you on the flip side, my man. Yeah, catch you guys on the flip side. <laughs> right, Appreciate man. it, Juice. Thanks, man. Thanks, Juice, man. Right, Thanks. Have yeah. a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Juice. Right. Bye. Later. Yeah, as uh, as Juice was saying about uh, Probert, he started at a young age getting involved with uh, pain pills, alcohol, and he thought it was cool because he was a bigger guy that he could drink more than anybody on his team. Right. So he enjoyed drinking because mm-hmm. it was like it was like another game for him because he's good at it. Right. And, and then again, the womanizing and all that other fun stuff. Well, and again, as as you know, we had all discussed, you know let's not forget that this guy is getting into this at a very young age. Mm-hmm. So for anybody outside of the circle of professional sports or anything like that, and we could go on for days talking about uh, the, uh, one of the things Juice Man had mentioned, you know, athletes being put on a pedestal. Right. And I mean, admire that is, that's NFL through and through, by the way. Oh, not even well, NFL. That's high school. I, I see that. I was going to say, that's great I've school. Seen, I've seen that at the high school level in this area with certain athletes that correct. I should say the result, the, oh, the right. ultimate result is them getting into the NFL, but it, it's right. these kids at these younger ages. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not just that, right? It's uh, look at uh, basketball programs. You know, so college basketball programs, mm-hmm. these guys get recruited out of high school, like immediately into college. They might spend a year or two if they're lucky. Mm-hmm. And I'm just talking like Duke's program, right? That's just that was that was Coach Shashevsky one hundred and one. Mm-hmm. Give them one or two years, we know that they're going to go pro. Right. I think I'm going to go pro. <laughs> that, that was that was that was uh, again just that. Mm-hmm. So when the, these the, these kids at this age are raised to that level, they are in fact put on this pedestal. Hey man, you're going to make a you know a zillion dollars someday. Like you're going to really be something big. Really be something. It, it becomes this. I don't want to say idolatry, but it's just this, wow, this, this hero worship, like, right. And they're teenagers for Christ's sake, they're Mm -hmm. teenagers. So tell you all of that to circle back to the Bob Probert thing. This guy gets into the, the, the farming camp for, you know, major league hockey here. You know, this is NHL, the, the farming team. Mm -hmm. So this, this guy is in his late teens, boozing hard. And in fact, as you know, Matt had mentioned, uh, the more you booze and, you know, well, the, the, the more the man that I think that I am or the more that I can, you know, match up to everyone else or even outdo someone else. You don't even know. Yeah. You don't even know. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's it's insane. It's right. absolutely insane. Yep. See, so yeah, this, this guy, Probert, was drafted from the Junior Hockey League in 1984 by his team that he loved right across from Windsor, Detroit, Detroit. Red Wings. And right away, he was considered a gunfighter, like uh, what we were talking about with Juice, always getting into these fights, Mm -hmm. um, winning all his fights. Uh, He would even wait, like, after he was penalized, after being in a fight, he would come out of the penalty box and go right after the guy he just fought. That's awesome as hell, by the way. (laughs) What's that? that, This just what... what what Matt had <laughs> had made, what it's absolutely obvious and it's clear and it's it's known. These guys can't wait to get out of the box mm-hmm. to just go back to fighting just again. To fight like more. you said, they were on cocaine. That's yeah, all. It was the eighties. He's like, "Come on, man, I'm coming down. I'm but, coming down. I gotta get out of the box." But I was thinking about that fighting and stuff like that, and these guys fighting. They, they say they don't fight as much anymore in hockey. Do you think there was anybody like in a fight? They're fist fighting. Mm-hmm. What if you know martial arts or something? And you well, could fuck. You could do something like you're that. You're not okay. With so. blades cutting people's okay. throats. <laughs> Thank you, not, Matt. Not necessarily okay. kick. Not necessarily. Oh, that guy's dead. Not necessarily kicking somebody. I'm talking about just like you know, know some moves. You well, know I thought what the mean? same thing. Why? Why wouldn't you train to be a boxer if you knew you were going into the NHL? Like that would be could some you good training. Jujitsu or something. You know, somebody well, could put them in like a death hole. You know, like a death grip hold. On there the are ice. so many things happening right now. The first <laughs> thing that pops into my mind is the whatever Lotus move from Blades of Glory. Oh, the, oh, yes. the ice skating. Yeah. 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 With uh, whoever, John Heater, you know, Napoleon right. Dynamite and uh, uh, yeah. Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell, yeah. Yes. So that Classic. thing. Okay. So let's everyone be clear. These skates weigh a lot. Mm-hmm. You're covered in pads. Right. There is no fucking way you're able to lift up your <laughs> and leg and, and like, kick yeah, karate. <laughs> Be- no, yeah. While you're trying to balance yourself. In the meantime, while somebody is trying to punch you in the face and is essentially trying to rip your jersey, or I should say, over your head, head. pull your jersey over the head, Mm -hmm. which was, which is classic. It's really meant to just stop your arms from moving. Like Mm -hmm. if, you know, you 
try to you know pull your shirt off over your head. I can't move, mom. I can't move my arms. Right. Yeah, you know, it, it's that. That's that's the move. If you get that jersey in that spot, man, you're in. Just you're just done. You're you're getting lit up. But I'm just wondering if anybody ever applied like a fighting style. I, I, yeah, I would. You know what I'm trying to say though, yeah. like a fighting style. Like they're just throwing haymakers. But if you had like a every technique. punch, every punch is a haymaker. Yeah. Every single one, like the uh, like the fighting tiger or whatever, right. or like yeah, you just take like a stance. Mm-hmm. You, you can tell when you know. What See, I, mean? I would have like threw my gloves down, and then when he came out, I start skating around. <laughs> like, hey, catch him! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah. Why did he throw his gloves down? Catch that guy! <laughs> I think fighting Matt I Hidden Hextall. I would have yeah. like that would have been great. Yeah. Hextall, he was the goalie for the Flyers. Philadelphia Flyers. There you yeah. go. As brought to you by one of our number one fans. So anyway, talking oh, in yeah. the 80s. Oh, yeah, my gosh. We got a we got a fan out of uh, the yeah. uh, suburbs of Philadelphia who yeah. loves everything there is to know about Philadelphia. Oh, awesome. I don't care what the hell sport it is. She loves it. Cool. Well, then she'll dig this, I guess. We're talking about Philly. Thank you, stuff Philly like lady. That. Yeah, we appreciate it. But anyway, back to the 80s. So in the 80s, like we were talking about the cocaine, uh, Cocaine was huge, mm-hmm. and a lot of the hockey players, I, I don't know how many in general, but in the 80s, I was, I was nine. I'm saying I missed it. I was it. nine, man. So I, was, I guess I was four. We were all four-ish when the 80s started, mm-hmm. and we were 14-ish when the 80s ended. When it ended, yes. Yeah, so not bad. Yeah, we're kind of 80s kids. Alas, we yeah. missed the rage of cocaine. Right. But we, we were in that teen, like we missed that cool teen time. Yeah, like by our the, move, yeah, we're just by like, the time we by like were, five, six years, we're off. It yeah. became crack then. Yeah, yeah. All we we, we didn't want to be in that time. All we got was <laughs> stupid brick weed. Yeah, it smelled like mothballs. Mm-hmm. Well, none none of the hockey players were on crack. They good, were, they were doing good, coke. Good, good. Uh, so Probert, you know, he's going through some shit, and then all of a sudden, you know, you think you're floating by, and then you hit the law trouble. Uh oh. So he's going into Canada one day, uh, hits a pole in his uh, Monte Carlo SS. Nice looking car, by the way. Yes, it was. It's it over. Right. Did you see mm. that thing? Dude, a dude, there is something so special in my heart about that 80s Monte Carlo SS. I remember having a paper route and driving, oh, I'm sorry, driving and riding my bike every day past this one dude's yeah. Monte Carlo SS with everything mm-hmm. that looked exactly like that car, mm-hmm. except for the color. It was a, a Dark burgundy, almost oh, brownish. Yes. I know, I know that color. Yeah, I wanted that car so goddamn bad. Mm. I thought that was the hottest, coolest, fastest man. Look the hell out car you could ever have, ever have. Like, forget the concept of a, an I Rock. Forget any of that. That Monte Carlo SS was banging, and there was a what was a the GM. Grand National, I think, was the equivalent. Yeah, the of Grand it. National was the black one. They only made so many of them, right? Yeah, they're worth a ton right now. So, well, yeah. so GM and Chevy is all coming out of the same. It was know. a Buick Buick Grand National. That's okay, what it was. there it yeah. is the the Buick Grand National. So they all got spit out of the same, you know, womb, basically. Right. You know, GM Chevy, it's all the same shit. But there was something so special about that. God yeah. damn, I want that car. Well, Probert's uh, Monte Carlo SS was shit. Because he ran it into a freaking pole. Well, then that happened. <laughs> so he got jacked up, uh, torn cartilage in his rib, uh, stitches in his face. The guy's all jacked. And then he's like, shit. So after that, there comes more trouble, more drunk drivings. He gets uh, he gets counseling, though. But he goes to counseling, and he gets drunk because he knows the counselor lady brings her home for a smash fest. Mm. <laughs> not in the, then, obviously not in the Monte Carlo. <laughs> yeah, the dude was smooth. Real quick, back to the Monte Carlo. Uh, Monte. Monte Carlo. No, Monte. Real, quick, <laughs> real uh, quick, back to the Monte Carlo. I was curious because he bought that with his signing bonus, correct? Yep. Oh, so, what a kick in the nuts. I know. Are and you it was kidding total, me? Total, yeah, he was pissed about dude, that. Dude, this is like, oh, my gosh, this monumental time in my life. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to take this money. I'm going to buy myself a flashy car because I'm only a fucking teenager. And off I go. So uh, a V8 SS had a base price of about thirteen four. And then, uh, you know, in what year this is, uh, well, this is an 87. So it's, it's it was around there, around there, 87 yeah. Monte Carlo SS. And uh, if you got the aero coupe, it was like 14, eight. So you probably spent around 15, I bet, you know, a little over 15. I was just curious, like, you in know, today, I, in today's it, dollars, that would approach $50,000. About $50,000. Cause I think yep. his, his, uh, his salary, I think was 80. He mm. signed for like three years at 80. Is that the color? Oh that's God. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, the one. color. Yeah, that flashback. Oh my God, I want. <laughs> to look in the car. burgundy 
dark yeah, SS. It's that, oh my god, sharp looking car. It's not brown. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's this deep, deep red. And oh my god, it's so good. So <laughs> dang. As we as we were talking about these kids and athletes being put on pedestals. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway, this guy DUIs, uh, hitting shit, um, trying to get counseling. But he was still so popular in the NHL. Like, he was friends with Mr. T, uh, the Slapshot Brothers. What were those two guys' names? Yeah, I saw the... On like, the, the yeah, he was doing promotions with them. Mm-hmm. And, like, all this stuff was getting The pushed. Hanson Brothers, right? Yeah, the Hansons. Yeah. It was all pushed to the side because this guy was a, a great athlete and good at fighting. And that's right. what people liked. Yeah. So they're trying to get him help. And the guy just won't... He, he just can't do it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm you, laughing. You were smacking like you were going to say <laughs> Dude, something. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm laughing at myself over here because I'm thinking about Slapshot and how much I love that movie. You know, I, I hate I hate to say that I don't know if I've ever seen it. Jesus God! And if I did, it was like bits and pieces. You should but be ashamed. I'm of going to watch it, obviously, because mm. uh, that movie's a movie is it is available. Uh, you could go onto your old uh, Comcast uh, clicker or oh no, okay. You got to pay for that one. Is that like a I well twenty four ninety nine or no? I so let's be clear. There are some of us who may or may not be subscribed to cable. Mm-hmm. Some of us may just stream. Slapshot was just available. The other day, Mm-mm. on it just not available. I'm just saying it was playing. Randomly. It was just playing, right? Well, yeah. I have YouTube TV, which is all the live channels. It should have been on there. Give I'm sure I shot. could find it. Yeah, I'm give it a shot. shot. Oh my god, so good. Oh, fun fact. Mm. Fun fact. So I am married. Uh huh. And congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good job. I'm sorry, <laughs> I've been for quite a while. So there is a song on the slap shot soundtrack soundtrack that made its way to the. John Zapp marriage soundtrack. Oh wow! Because at the time we got it. Was that that one or is that a different? I one? just heard. I look over and Matt just. <laughs> oh god! Here it goes. Here it goes. So the the John Zapp marriage soundtrack. There was a uh, as as wedding gifts. Uh, we, uh, we gave away CDs. Mm-hmm. It's you know. I was like, oh, you like this song? I like this song. Okay, let's put Here's a bunch of playlist. songs together. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's our mixtape, mm-hmm. but it was CDs. That's a compact disc for anyone who doesn't know what a CD is. So. One of the tracks from that movie made it on. It was uh, by Maxine Nightingale. Mm. Look it up. Ah, uh-huh, check it out. You'll what, hear it when you watch called? when you watch the movie. You'll hear it. What's the song called? Maxine uh, Nightingale. Mm. Right back to where we uh, started from. Oh, I know that song. Yeah, I know that song. That's right. Is that it? That's yeah, that's one. it. Yeah, I know that one. That's. I mean, I'm. That's I'm, a good jam. I'm putting together what Matt's putting down here. Yeah, right. I, I'm. I'm not Maxine Nightingale or nothing. No, but that was good. Yeah, thank you. I got. You. I got it off of that. All right. Where were we at with a uh, young, young Bobby Probert? Oh, anyway, so the guy is fighting NHL, having a great season, makes it to the NHL uh, All Star Game, meets uh, you know Wayne Gretzky. He's all living the, the life. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah all and the big Mr. guys. T, all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they they make it to the playoffs that year. But at the playoffs, before one of the biggest games of the year, I think it's tied, him and his buddies, they all go out and they're drinking at this place called Lucy Goosey's or something like that, some mm-hmm. club. And one of the assistant coaches comes in and catches them all there. So he's hung over the next day, plays a shit game. You know, he, he tries his best. But it all gets aired out into the, to the, the media. Uh, the media. Mm-hmm. And then, then all shit starts hitting the fan. Falling apart. Yeah. He was on a downward spiral from there, and that's where his uh, wife, who's super hot, oh Danny, my God. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she she comes she's into the picture. Ugly. She's not, not at all. No, no. So he meets Danny, and uh, things start turning around a little bit. Things are kind of going better, and uh, she thought that she could be his way out of like the drug and alcohol addi- addiction, but it still starts spiraling. Uh, he gets three months in jail, or six months actually. For the convictions for another drunk driving. Now, this one, he was also caught with cocaine. Did you guys see about that or read Mm -hmm. about that? No. All right. So he was heading through a tunnel back into the United States coming from Canada. Canada. Mm -hmm. He was caught uh, on crossing the border. He had an expired visa. So right away, they're like, this visa is expired. Not an ATM visa. Yeah. Yeah. He's not trying to get cash. And not a Mexican visa. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is a, you know, look, man. I work right the fuck over there. I yeah. can see it. Right yeah. There, I like yeah. I'm Bob Probert. I work right over there. But they right. couldn't, they, they said they were going to try to let this guy go, but he, they said there was like bottles of alcohol clanking around in the car. He had, awesome. I miss those <laughs> days. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, they were like, what did, is this guy trying did, to get caught? Did you ever hear a theory on that? Like when you have alcohol, like people say, if you get in an accident, if you keep a bottle under your seat, 
and you get pulled over. And the say answer to this is yes, that is true. So my one bro is, or I should say my one bro has made an incredible name for himself mm-hmm. as a criminal defense attorney mm-hmm. in the Commonwealth of Virginia, specifically in DUI stuff. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he had, as a result of some of the cases that, you know, in which he participated, uh, they ended up changing the laws in Virginia. One of the greatest ones, if not the greatest ones, was the definition of operating a motor vehicle. So, okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. So I know all of this, but it doesn't matter. I'm going off on a tangent. Point is, this will be the first guy that tells you, look, man, if you get into a car accident. And you're drinking. And, you're, and you, you had been drinking, get the fuck out of the car, open a bottle up, and start guzzling as much as you can. Or it, it, mm-hmm. not even as much as you can. Just get it on your breath. Get something. Dump half of the fucking bottle out if you need right. to. Because by the time the cops arrive, fuck, man, I'm sorry. I, I was so, I, I needed to calm down. Like I, I needed I, something. I, I was so upset at this accident. You never heard mm. that before? No. Yeah. I've I kind of heard like where you're, you pull over and you throw your keys out the window thinking you can't get a DUI. If you don't but, have the keys. But yeah, that's that's That false. doesn't make a lick of sense. No, they said if you don't have the keys in the car, if you're pulled over to the side of the road and your keys are outside of the car and a cop stops by and you're in the car. But you don't have like keys. Like sleeping on the other side and you don't have the keys. They said you won't get a DUI. But uh, they said that's that false. must be from that shitty lawyer that, on the other side of town. That- <laughs> <laughs> Lionel Hutz. Yeah, Lionel. <laughs> Lionel Hutz. There's the truth. Then there's the truth. Ah. So I'm sorry. I, I got to go back to it. So with respect to operating a motor vehicle. Uh-huh. Uh, so my bro had uh, a client who was at a party one night and he definitely got, you know, loaded, absolutely loaded, left the party, went out to his car, decided, you know what? I'm not going to drive home tonight. I'm just going to sit in my car and listen to the radio. I'm sure I'm going to fall asleep. And when I wake up, everything will be okay. I'll be sober. Yeah. So he had his key in the ignition and he turned it to the accessory section Right. The, the, the the first click before you start to try to turn over the engine. Just mm-hmm. the, the, the click that's going to turn on the electrics. The, in listen the to the radio section. That's right. right. So the client of his turned it to the accessory position, listened to the radio, falls asleep. Hours later, knock, knock. Cops are on the, you know, banging on the window. Hey, man, you know, what the fuck? What's going on? Cops pulled a guy out of the car. He blows hot. DUI? DUI. Of course. However, how is he driving under the influence? The car's not moving. Well, okay, car is not moving. The argument on the the side of the Commonwealth of Virginia is, well, he was operating a motor vehicle. Mm-hmm. Well, was he operating a motor vehicle or was he just operating the fucking radio? He right. was still operating the vehicle. As a result of this whole case, my bro ended up getting the the definition of operating a motor vehicle changed in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Like, vehicle must be in motion, engine must be going. Oh, That's wow. awesome. So, yeah. That's awesome. There you go. So, yeah, Probert wasn't trying to do any of that shit. He, he just had He said, and, fuck he, it. He was going all out. And then, and then to make matters more fun, he had a grinding uh, mill. Do you guys know what that is? No. It's uh, it's used I've, for, like, cocaine or marijuana. Like, and it's a little mill, and you put, like, your whatever in there, and you grind it up. Oh, so it's so, a personal thing. Yeah, so it's sitting on the floor with, like, freaking powder everywhere. And they were cocaine like, look, powder. yeah, they're like, look, man, we got to go to the station. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> so they take him down there. Why and didn't he, he just throw his keys out the window? I don't know. He's not, <laughs> listen, he's not listening to any of this shit. <laughs> don't mind the bottles in that cocaña. Yeah. My keys is on the floor. <laughs> Why didn't he just throw his keys out the that window? That would have been great. But he didn't. He didn't, yeah. man. He didn't listen to any reason. They yeah. took him to the station, you know, strip search him, whatever. Uh-huh. Then he has uh, 14.3 grams of cocaine in his underwear. So they were wow. like, man, this guy's caught. What is fourteen three like? What that's I'm, pretty. That's pretty good chunkies. Go ahead. I have a question. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Why did he have cocaine in his underwear? Because he was trying to sneak it across the border. That oh. was his whole. Oh. oh, okay. Even though you, that's what they said. They, he had bottles clinking everywhere and a freaking mill full of powder on the floor. What have we learned over the course of all of these podcasts? Mm-hmm. Rule number one: If you're gonna break the law. Only break one law That's at a right. time. That's right. Not six or seven. So anyway, the guy's busted. Uh, Danny's not helping him at all. You know, six months in jail. His wife you're talking about? Yeah. Because she was like, hey, he's with me. He's not going to do this shit anymore. He, he's still doing it. But she was in the car with him. She didn't know what was going on. Oh. 
So she's in on it too. Okay. Yeah, no, not in, I don't know. I think she was like thinking it's fun. This guy is an athlete. He gets away with everything. Right. I don't think she was worried about it. Felt untouchable. Yeah. It's so. like being su- it's like being married to Superman without two front mm-hmm. teeth. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you said, that pedestal thing. They probably do get away with a lot. Oh my th- god! Think yeah. how many times they probably got pulled over and nothing happened. You know. I, well, I was waiting for Matt to to finish the story with you know he got pulled over with bottles clanking around, uh, fourteen grams of coke on him. Mm-hmm. And the finale, I was waiting to hear that the cop asked him yeah. for his autograph. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah I no. know, right? <laughs> Can we escort you home, or you know? Well, no, because like he was that. coming. This guy wasn't a Detroit fan. He might have liked the uh, the Aloysians or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> one the, of those the, Canadian well, teams, the Blackhawks. Yeah, yeah. You know. yeah he he didn't like. He he was probably like, man, I'm getting this guy. The Aloysians. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's is Canadian that for the uh, Whalers. Yes, is that what it yes. Is? So he serves a sentence. He he was you know in jail, did his thing, came back to Detroit. They let him come over and play, and uh, he was welcomed back. Uh, and actually, it was ironic that his first game back, he you know scored a goal, and nice. everybody was like, "Hey, this guy's really making a turn for the good." After getting out of jail, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah they still had him on contract, so they brought him back in. But mm-hmm. they said he had to go under. Uh, they were testing him now. Oh, like piss test. Yeah. Oh, uh, see if he was you know blowing hot. What's blowing going hot. on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, testing him for drinking before games at practices. They were giving him random drug tests. And, and he was doing pretty well. But they also said a friend of his was saying that he knew when they were going to do it because he was getting, like, tipped off. Mm-hmm. So he would have clean urine from friends, mm-hmm. and then he would have, you know, his stuff. Right. So when they told him, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a parole officer. They weren't sitting there watching you. So he'd pee in it, and they say he knew how to put in, like, the microwave for, like, two seconds or three seconds or something like that. Made it warm enough to room temperature. they test it and say, oh, he's okay. Well, I, I, I've heard other ways. Yeah, but. I was going to say, I heard of somebody... I think just recently talking Basically, about so what I've heard taping it to your yeah your yep. leg you, to keep it you temp, get yeah. you, you get clean piss from your friend you mm-hmm. just keep it close to your body right in the old crotch right you know right in the, the the hottest part of a man's body is between you know his legs there mm-hmm. right by the old jumblies mm-hmm. uh, it'll stay warm all day right there oh no doubt you can get but it but that's up not under for that. like like the pos and stuff don't think about getting away with that shit don't they they watch you. Like the whole thing today, they do. Yeah, mm-hmm. not back in the eighties or nineties. No, this was nineties around day. this time. Well, and even back then, I mean, you know, nobody was shaving back then. No, like, you can put it right in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> you, you couldn't see shit. Right, you could pull out a lot of stuff out of it. <laughs> you had the hair curtain. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, you could hide all kind of stuff in there. Like taking actual people out to like make them piss for you. Like, I'm surprised. Set them down. down. I'm surprised. I guess that I understand now why he hid the coke in his underwear because he could just hide it in his, you know, and yeah, in the pubes. In the pubes. The bush. (laughs) The Canadians weren't. They weren't trimming back then. They had a mullet down there. (laughs) They had a hockey haircut on their balls. (laughs) I wonder if they did. Maybe I don't know. Maybe. I'll have to ask Juice on that. Yeah, ask Juice. Know. That'd be <laughs> cool, eh? Yeah. Is it possible for one to shave a mullet on their privates? On their pubes. And, okay. <laughs> I have to look into that. I'm going to try. So Probert, Bob Probert, mm-hmm. he married Danny because she was trying to see through all this. He's he's doing better. So fine. They were married mm-hmm. in 93. She is. And she became pregnant. And right away, Probert, uh, he fell hard uh, back. He fell hard off the wagon. So he started drinking again. Mm -hmm. He thought that Danny, his wife, was trying to trap him because he was like this athlete. You know, athletes tell other athletes. Is this their first kid together? Their first kid together. They did have four. They had one son, three daughters. But this is the first one. This is the very first one. Gotcha. Um, He got more wild than ever, according to his wife. Uh, And he was out one day, went out with some friends, went drinking, hopped on his motorcycle, and wrecked into another pole, I think on a four-way crossing. He fell right onto the hard concrete, uh, busted up his elbow, his arm, uh, his ribs, uh, shoulder injury, and he was arrested again. Another. This guy's not meant to operate motor vehicles. Mm-mm. No, and a lot of times now with sports uh, teams and stuff, they'll, they'll have con- you can't ride motorcycles, you can't do things like that because you're an asset to the team. You know, and they're they call it the uh, Roethlisberger rule. The Roethlis- is that kind of a- so? This is before out, all yeah. that, I guess. Yeah, because a lot of these guys. Spoken. Beautifully spoken. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. A lot of these guys now, like you said, they sign those big contracts to go out and buy like these souped up motorcycles. They're like, nah, if you get, if you get hurt on that, you get nothing. Yeah. You kind of avoid everything. Yep. But after, after he was arrested this time, I guess uh, Detroit has had it. Uh, They cut him from the team. And this is uh, really, I guess when depression really set in for him because he had nothing. 
he has like this family he's Mm -hmm. trying to raise and you know his wife's not working because she's used to that easy money so Mm -hmm. at this point we're in the so detroit cut him what is that 94 around there yeah 94 ish 90, 95 yeah, 94 95 okay mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he took like a little time off and then he was you know started training again uh even though he was still on the drugs he was signed back with the chicago blackhawks yeah which is your squad. You yeah, yeah. <laughs> but people were saying he lost his edge because man's into drugs and alcohol right so, sounds like he might have something to prove mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and in order to do this you know he lost a little bit of that edge he started taking steroids steroids made his depression and shit worse uh he was having fits of rage, which they say that you get roid rage. Yeah, yeah, like different than cocaine rage, I guess. It's like a whole, whole nother ball game. Mm. Ball. So the old, <laughs> the old jumblies shrivel up into like prunes and raisins. That's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, as too, I, I too have heard that. Mm-hmm. I've never taken steroids. I have not. I have I, not either. No. They were big though. I remember in. I think we. You know of somebody maybe? They were fun yeah. to joke about, at least, you know, amongst the, you know, the, the tree of us. Like, what right. the hell do we know about steroids? But, right. you know, I, I've i never met anyone who used them. Well, we no. used to take, uh, like, whey protein. I remember, what was that other stuff? Um, uh, creatine. Creatine. Oh, my, creatine yeah, powder. Yeah, still like oh, I remember that. I remember yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for like that was all the rage. That, that was the, the rage. Not roid rage. rage. At your local GNC. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I mean, creatine still is, like, huge. My son's in the lifting now mm-hmm. in the past, like, six months, and that's one of the things they take. What amino acids, branch, uh, yeah. branch amino acids, creatine, blah, blah, blah. It's like when jazz. your muscles rip, it helps put them together quicker. I think the way creatine actually takes the water out of your, or puts the water back in and makes you. Cut, like ripped or something? Yeah. I'm no scientist. I don't know, I don't know yeah. shit about fuck about creatine. Me, me neither. Know. Creatine, yeah. It wasn't working for me, I'll tell no. you that much. No. <laughs> I, was on, I was on that shit hard. <laughs> I was eat, So I was the dumbass just trying to eat tuna sandwiches all day. Uh, yeah, take w- your tuna in like that. When we were. Protein, yeah, I was, I was snorting creatine. I was injecting that shit. When we were in high school, I was, I was, I was eating two tree, uh, you know, tuna sandwiches every day in addition to regular meals. No just lo- trying to pack on protein. Yeah, like. In high school, playing football, like I, I think my biggest, my highest weight was like one seventy, like in my twelfth grade year, one sixty eight or something like that. But we used to go to Pizza Hut. Fatty, I know. What <laughs> it was like, Lou, who we spoke about, a bunch of us. I know Lou, Matt would have been there. God you you probably were even there. Lou. There was a Pizza Hut by uh, the mall on Paxton Street. I think they just closed that recently. And it was a buffet, and you could go up and just keep going back up. It was an all-you-can-eat buffet. Getting the wings and the pizza. Sticks. Yeah, you would literally eat like a whole pizza. Like I know where you're at. It's right yeah. by. Uh, it's it's since converted into some kind of you know mobile phone carrier. Right. It's right Cricket. by. It's right by the Dunkin'. It's right by the. Is it the one it's, by the Dunkin' it's Donuts? It's in front of the Dolphin County Prison, like on that front side of the Dolphin Burger King's County right on, there. On. Oh, that pizza. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Oh, okay. I know yep. where you're at. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. They used to have it. Yeah, we used to, we used to tear that shit up, man. Mm-hmm. I remember that. It was all about just eating and eating because you're burning it off so fast. It's still open. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I believe it. So. Out of all that, into the steroids, um, his body was too broken and beaten. Uh, nothing's really helping him. So he turns back to these uh, oxy pills that he has because he's saying, you know, I'm hurt to the doctor. The doctors don't know you're an addict. So they describe, hey, or prescribe you, describe. describe they prescribe you, you these, these pills. He's like, here's some oxy. They'll help you, you know, with the pain, this and that. The guy's an addict. So when you say oxy, you're talking painkillers. Yes. Okay. Oxycodone, codine, codeine. Okay. Oxy is what they call it, correct? Oxy. Yep. If you say, look, it, yeah, yeah. So he, um, the oxy wasn't, it was too slow for him. So according I to hear, like, I hear oxy, I think of, you know, zit medicine. Oh yeah. Or oxy clean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what the fuck do I know about oxy? You know, I, yeah, I, I, I think of the stuff that I, uh, throw in my laundry. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he used to dip these into Coca-Cola to take the uh, time release off of them. Oh yes. Yeah. I heard about this. And he would, yeah. Wipe them down, get the time release off the capsules. Go ahead. I have a question. Go ahead. How does that work? Time release? To be clear, what was the point of dipping a pill in Coca-Cola? I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go. go, yeah. go. I'm sorry. It, I'm sorry. It, would, it would take the time release, the capsule around it, because it was like slow release. So It was like an outer, outer covering. And then when he would get the covering off, he would use a little nail file to file it down. To like get it real thin, and then he would snort it. So that's the part that I can't I can't wrap my head around. So when I think of pills, I think of two different kinds. I think of something that comes in a gelatin capsule that will ultimately that gelatin will you know go away, and the powder that's containing some sort of powder. 
mm-hmm. that one can't file away. Mm-hmm. Right. Alternatively, I think of, I don't know, a multivitamin or a, a caplet or something that is a hard substance. These that, are like the Advil or the Tylenol that have like that rubber or whatever, that coating. The orange around The it. orange around it or the orange and white. It's like a coating. Okay. He would so dip that's it. Yes. Is. He so would put it in soda for a few minutes. I guess he had it down because he did it all. They said he was up to 18 oxycodine a day. Dang. So it's the coating. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I would imagine. It's On not- a hard pill, not a gelatin caplet. Right. Or I'm sorry, a gelatin pill. And I would imagine uh, some of those time release ones are like much thicker on the, mm-hmm. the coating. Mm-hmm. I, guess, I would assume. Okay. Yeah. I'm no scientist. No, me neither. <laughs> so, so through all this, uh, going back and forth to the doctors diagnosed with anxiety and depression, and the doctors are already saying he had CTE, which is uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Mm-hmm. Encephalopathy. Yeah. Sure. CTE. And and that is basically from uh, repeated head trauma and blows to the head, which he was in thousands of fights. And we see that with you know NFL players, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a boxers. lot of them go crazy yeah. from that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it leads to some of them killing people, committing suicide, right? Um, Coconut was, pickers, Jun- Junior Se- uh, Jun- Junior uh, Junior Seau was one, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, also they had in what's his name's brain that killed the guy, played for the uh, New England Patriots. Oh. Um, Aaron Hernandez. Hernandez. They said yeah. he had he had that on his brain. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 real stuff, man. It's, right. It, it it affects a lot of people. Um, he was still dealing hard with uh, alcoholism and depression. Uh, he had early onset Alzheimer's, which wasn't helping at all. And uh, it came to a head. He was drinking one evening with a friend, and his friend had mushrooms. So he's half drunk. Dear Uh-oh. God. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to turn out well. Gives him mushrooms. And according to the documentary, uh, he was saying that he didn't know what they were. So he's eating them. Just, you know, how people say like a cap or what, whatever. Sure. Yeah. He, he's taking handfuls. I've heard. Of the bag. I've heard oh. how to eat mushrooms. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't do it like that. You, you rev, like, that's build a up lot of mushrooms. No, no. You just a little, little cap or a half or. Right. You don't take a, a whole bag yeah. of it. No, no. You're not eating bags of mushrooms. Yeah, dude. This isn't, you know, a side order of vegetables. Right. Yeah, so, just a little, just a little taste. Just a little bit. So his friends are looking at him like, what the fuck is this guy doing? And yeah. he goes back into the house. Now the kids are around. He said, it's one of his daughters saying he looked at her and like he, she never seen anything like, like he was looking right through her. He didn't even know that she was there. Right. And he goes into the kitchen, starts grabbing things, and he sees these knives. And he takes the knives, he's throwing them around the room. You know, his wife's freaking out. She's like, what the hell? She calls her dad. Her dad's like, call 911 right away. He's still, he's jumping on tables, like doing roll arounds on the floor. He's yeah. just, he's just tripping balls right this now. This guy's tripping balls. Okay. Okay. So they call the police. Police come. He gets in a brawl with the police. He thinks he's got, he's a big dude, man. Oh, yeah. And Poli- he's known to fight. <laughs> yeah. So the police, you know, finally get a hold of him. Um, take him to jail again. Guy's going back to jail. He likes it there. Apparently, I don't know. Hey, he's struggling. He 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 has problems. Yeah. So his wife leaves him. Uh, comes back in a little bit, and his his wife looks good. I mean, he's getting counseling. Everything yeah, she does. Oh, his his wife or life? Oh, his life. Damn. <laughs> both both both. Look good. both are looking good. I, I, that was Freudian. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. His his life his life was looking good. Yeah. <laughs> I with heard his why. wife. I heard why. I did too, okay. but I, I was like, yeah. His life was good. It was good. It was All blonde, <laughs> blue eyes. <Blue-eyed. laughs> great in a bikini. Yeah. Life is great. Life is great. So anyway, yeah, they worked on their relationships, uh, getting close with his kids, becoming like a dad, like playing with the kids in the house, like jumping around, doing stuff. Mm-hmm. What were you going to say? No, I was just saying that video, like they showed some of the home videos at the time when he was in his depression. He's laying there sleeping on the couch mm-hmm. during like uh, Christmas, morning. Christmas time yeah. and all that. It was just sad. You know what I mean? Like, like you said, it is a very, very sad story where this guy's life headed. Yeah. Sometimes like again on the show, we, we try to make light to like make mm-hmm. it entertaining, but like to the point, we're trying to get at, like, we're talking about this guy because it is compelling. And then a lot of stuff that happened to him. Mm-hmm. And and I think, like, a lot of people listening are like, well, what happened to him? Right, right. Because, yeah, we're still talking. I mean, going through all this. Um, on July 5th, 2010, on Lake St. Clair, Bob and his family were boating. And it was a hot day. Like, everybody's out there having fun. They're going to ski and do all this stuff. Uh, Bob goes to the end to try to get something from, I guess he's trying to pull in the anchor or whatever. And he just collapses. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's a massive, massive heart attack. 45, right? Mm hmm. 45 years old. 45 years old. Damn. So, yeah, the, the family's freaking out. They try to get him back. 
And what's sad about this is they did get him to the hospital, but they were saying try to keep it quiet who it was because around that area he was he was huge. He's a celebrity. Well He's yeah. still a celebrity for sure. So like two of his daughters who were in their teens at the time, they found out through friends. They were like, what? It's all over the news. They didn't even know their dad passed away. They didn't even know away. that it happened. They wow. didn't even know. <laughs> they didn't even know, yeah. That's horrible, though. That is horrible. But that's how it ended. Now, I mean, he does he does a lot of money towards charity. He does charity rides. He was a big motorcycle guy, mm-hmm. even though he drove a lot drunk, which is stupid. Right. But people, people, people are people, stuff. man. Yeah, it's part of life. I mean, I think anybody, at, at you know, if, if you... I mean, I shouldn't say anybody, but I think a lot of people have done that at some point. Some are just luckier than others with, with drinking and driving and doing This guy like was enabled to get away with it. Right. Now think about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you have an employer who really, really, really needs you to show up for work, mm-hmm. they're going to clean up the dirty shit, you know, on the backside to make sure that you show up for work. Mm-hmm. This was that guy. He was an asset. Yeah. yeah, he was mm-hmm. valuable in his own way for sports. So they were able to, he was able to get away with a lot more than. Uh, and to be clear, I'm not saying that, you know, oh, the Red Wings are guilty of this guy's downfall or the Blackhawks are, you know, guilty of this guy's downfall. Not at all. Right. I'm just saying, like, this guy had, the, he always had an out. Like, essentially, you know, I'm Bob Probert. I can go out and get fucked up some night and I can do anything the fuck I want. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lose my fucking job. But it wasn't all that really. Um, a lot of it too was an addiction and a lot of people see past stuff like that. Like you said, enabled and a lot of people say, Oh, everybody does it. It's not, or Hey, it's drugs and alcohol. You're having fun. But a lot of times those things can turn into like a crutch and really like really debilitate people and ruin your life. You know, when you're, when you're important and you're making money, uh, like, like Zap was just saying, like, like I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, Joe Rogan's the number one podcast. In our country, of or all time. for now, for now, we're for working now, our way yeah. up there. But Slap he, Fest he, 98 there. He made a good comment the other day to put into perspective, like how when you're important and you're a moneymaker, he has a contract with Spotify. He was in some hot water for making comments during COVID and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were trying to get him off the air and cancel him and all that stuff. And one of his friends made a comment. He was talking about this the other day on an interview I heard. They said, he said, I'm the number one podcast in 96 countries. And his buddy was like, if you were the number 96 podcast in one country, you'd be gone. So it, ju- it just goes to show, like, because he so, you know, has so many listeners, of makes course. so much money. Joe like Rogan is to Spotify as Howard Stern is to Sirius. Right. It's just that easy. You're going to get away with a lot more. So just when these guys are that important and make that much money, and this guy's making money for the, the hockey team. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he's a draw at, at a certain point of his, of his life. He was enabled and able to get away with a lot more. I just uh, I, I feel bad for his family. I uh, feel bad for the guy, but uh, I thought it was I thought it was a good story to share. Uh, I feel compelled. No, I, I liked yeah, it. Okay, I mean, good, it, good. It was a something change. a little different. It's a little a, different. It's a change, and it's yeah. I mean, we have look know. not for nothing. I came in here tonight trying to figure this out. All right, mm-hmm. so the guy's not a serial killer. There is, of course, the true crime aspect. To the, ex- crimes. to the extent mm-hmm. that, sure, he was in prison for a bit, you know, mm-hmm. possession of cocaine, and, you know, maybe wrapping his sweet, sweet Monte Carlo oh, yes. around a pole, you know, you know some, some car accident. So, okay, there was some crimes there. When I first got into this, I, I was not at all compelled by this story. Not at all. Mm-hmm. But as we three walk this through, talk this through, the power of Matt compels you. Uh, yes. It does. I, I, sw- <laughs> I look. I'm a believer. Look, yeah. I am now officially compelled by this story. Cool. Yeah. I, cool. I am. That you. You made me a believer. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Going into preaching next. That was good. Nonprofit. Yeah. Definitely watching that that documentary that I watched today. Like really, you know, kind of drew it all together. You know, I knew not much about this story. And and then he- hearing this, I wanted to watch that beforehand, just so I had a little bit more info going into it. Mm-hmm. But it's it's definitely a to me, it was a good story, like interesting. I'm curious, Matt, what compelled you to get into this story? Uh, I think I was sitting around one evening. I think I had the next day off, uh, chilling, probably late at night, going through Netflix, and I was like, I don't know what to watch. And I saw that something popped up, something you might like, and I pressed on it. Was watching it for a few. I was like, oh. This is interesting. And I sat and, you know, watch it one of them late night watches. And I was like, it's a pretty good story. See, huh. if, if this would have been back in the day, we'd be doing one on Emmanuel. 
the French porn star? Yes. She's so talking about late at night. On a Skinamax. Emmanuel. Skinamax. Skinamax. Yeah. Yeah. So not just one. Emmanuel, but also Forever Emmanuel, Goodbye there, Emmanuel. Yeah, there's like 20 Emmanuels there in the Emmanuel sequels. series. Or Miami Spice. Or Emmanuel. Could been, there could have been a number of movies that we would have done. But you've evolved. You know, we, <sighs> Thank we, you. We're now, you know. 48, almost 48 years on this yes. earth. Can we move just for a a moment here since we're talking about Emmanuel. Yes. I, mean, Emmanuel. I, got, I got to put this out there. So a couple of podcasts ago, we talked about a concept called edging. Yes. So <laughs> I think I knew what edging was before I knew what edging was. Right. Only because I grew up with the Spice Channel. Yes. <laughs> to be clear. Click, 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 click. <laughs> to be clear, the scrambled Spice Channel, uh, yeah. we're just in that one just split enough. second. You can As catch something. Just, man, oh, I, I think I could see a boob there between the, the scramble. Right. So th- I think that was th- that was essentially edging. It's like a tease. You're just, yeah. yeah, you're just waiting like to a get A little, little bit of a tease, yeah. Anyway, just wanted to put that it, out it, there. Those are in the days if you slipped them a fisky for some free cable. Finsky. Was it yeah. a finsky? Is that it? Finsky. Fin. So finsky. Fin, yeah. fin is the is the five. Always good for a fin. Finsky. Right. Yeah, I hope, uh, hope everyone enjoyed it then. I'm, no, it was definitely glad cool, I man. This gave something good. new, I, put something am, new on the table. Uh, I am a, I am a newborn, reborn. I am compelled. The, no, I enjoyed it. This was it. good. Or to get this some people really back with the juice man and the hockey. You know, yeah. enjoy, enjoy some hockey. It's the winter. Watch some hockey. Yeah, yeah definitely. I honestly thought this was going to be a short one, but I'm glad that this turned into a really, really good time. Like, this was a great story. Definitely was. Cool. Definitely was. To I, be clear, despite... <laughs> <laughs> despite despite the guy's you know his bad you know turnout right. out in his life and whatnot I, again mm-hmm. i this this was good i'm glad we did this but yeah he he created there's four new lives he touched his his wife mm. many times <laughs> god dang you know she started out as a she was just working at the hotel yeah when motel holiday inn say what ah mm. guys all right but yeah no so I, I the one i have in store i will tell you right now and i'm gonna well, I'll talk to Zab about this because oh God. Like, him and I kind of, Matt writes up his stuff, coordinates his stuff on his own. Zab kind of helps me out with because I'm doing the editing and stuff. We got to go to work. But I got one that is going to be back to that disturbing, like serial killer, all that jazz. I'm going to leave you hanging, but it's going to be back to that. This one's pretty sick. I thought you, I got my pencil ready. I was going to write it down so I could start research. Well, I'll tell you off the air. We'll leave them hanging okay. a little all bit. Okay, all right. But, uh, but yeah. Let him on the edge. Let yeah. him on the edge. I, I was waiting to hear something about uh, Joe Biden and vaccine <laughs> mandates. <laughs> well, that's coming up. That'll be the next one. <laughs> oh. I actually don't have an arm <laughs> due to the, to the it vaccine fell o- It fell off. <laughs> <laughs> it actually grew back. Did you throw it out the window with the yeah, keys? It was, it was yeah. fine. It was Maybe fine. it grew back as a sixth finger. Maybe. Oh. A little bit of force. Yeah. Oh, wow. yes. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, we got to get around to that. But uh, yeah, we'll be back next week with a true crime. And I appreciate it. You guys got anything else in closing? No. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. This was great. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. So don't forget to find us on Facebook and Instagram at Old Dirty Basement and on TikTok at Old Dirty Basement Podcast. I guess that's it for now. We'll catch you where? On the flip side. If we don't see you sooner, we'll see you later. Peace. Thanks for hanging out in the Old Dirty Basement. If you dig our theme music like we do, check out the Tsunami Experiment. Find them on Facebook. Their music is available streaming on Spotify and Apple and where great music is available. You can find us at Old Dirty Basement on Facebook and Instagram and at Old Dirty Basement Podcast on TikTok. Peace. We Audi 5000. <laughs>